so I'm very pleased to announce that um, first up after the break, we have Sean Pryor from FutureLearn. Um, and Sean's going to talk about FutureLearn's thoughts on where we see HE or where we see the HE sector once the pandemic is over. Um, so we can see your slides already, Sean. So it's over to you. Uh, great, Phil. Thanks for the intro and thanks for the invitation today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, and speak uh, speak to you all. Um, just a bit of a background into FutureLearn, as I know some of the comments there in terms of, of who we are as a company. Um, we were we were founded in 2013 and was one of the um, original kind of MOOC providers, actually, um, developed through uh, the Open University. Um, we've expanded uh, into to other forms of online learning, so, so over and above MOOCs. Um, and yeah, now we are partnering with over 200 uh, HEIs uh, across the globe, increasingly industry partners, um, and looking at a range of products actually. So not just MOOCs, um, we're looking at uh, full degrees with some partners, um, micro credentials, which are essentially credit bearing modules, um, parts of uh, degrees, um, and, and shorter courses as well. So some MOOCs um, and, and um, extended MOOCs, which which are a kind of a key part of the future learn products offering, are, st are still available essentially. Um, and just to say, we partner with the University of Kent to um, deliver uh, a number of micro credentials and short courses. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of background to future learn. Um, in terms of the question and, and what we think the uh, HE sector will look like once the pandemic is over, um, I thought I'd start off by first about saying. Um, in terms of, of the shift that we've seen, um, this is really, uh, and the pandemic has been an acceleration of, of, of trends that we, we saw before the, uh, the pandemic, actually. Um, so two, two slides and two charts to start off with in terms of, first of all, distance learning in the US um, and the percentage of students um, that were taking some form of distance learning course, be that exclusively online um, or, or some kind of blended approach to learning. Um, back in 2012, that, that figure was around a quarter of, of, of all um, postgraduate courses, increasing up to over, over a third um, by 2018. So, again, th this shift to kind of an online um, delivery approach it, it is a trend that's been happening. This is not just, just as a result of the pandemic. Um, and the graph and the chart to the right there is about um, the ed tech space, actually, the, the, the four big ed tech providers, so Future Learning is, is one of those, um, Coursera, edX and Udemy. Um, and again, what it's showing there is that, that from 2017 to 2020, um, there was significant growth in the numbers of learners on these platforms. Um, and in total, the, the ed tech market, um, this is in 2020, was around 150 million learners. Um, actively engaging with courses on these EdTech platforms. So again, this is a, this is a trend here um, that we are, we, we're seeing and we've seen over the, the past decade essentially. And what we've seen over the last year is that the pandemic has, has kind of influenced and accelerated that change. Um, moving on. Um, I've pulled out three points really in terms of how we see uh, the, the, the pandemic uh, affecting the HG sector going forward. Um, again, I think they align with some of the stuff we've already picked up on. Louise mentioned learner-centred um, approaches to education, um, and I think that's that's the key one. But the the, the main point I'd, I'd pick up to start with is edtech and and, and future learning. Obviously, as part of that, is here to stay, uh, and is very likely to disrupt um, the he the he sector. Um, I don't know if people saw last week, but the, there was a big announcement from from Two U, one of the the big original OPM providers. Um, acquiring edX, uh, a, a MOOC platform developed by Harvard and MIT, um, which is a huge shift in the industry. And I think the, the learner base uh, and the number of partners that that, that organisation now has um, is, a, is a really significant shift in, in, in the potentially the, the edtech sec the edtech and the HE sector indeed. Um, and what they're looking at now is a, is a route from, from free content all the way up to degrees. And that 2U group now has that, that ability to, to offer that. Um, Few other slides and, and points here around the investment in the sector. Uh, huge sums going to, to lots of these platforms. Um, international expansion. So we know that lots of the platforms are looking to to offer their courses globally. These are not just specific markets that we are, be, that are being targeted. We're looking here at global expansion of the, of these companies uh, and the, the learner base that that will inevitably um, um, take over. 
Um, these these companies and Coursera's are leading on this, are looking at enterprise offerings, um, essentially working with industry and business to, to not only um, offer courses, but to build courses as well. So um, I think there's, this, and I'll come on to this, an opportunity here to, to think about uh, an ecosystem of learning rather than uh, just HCI specific, just industry specific, looking across and building pathways um, for, for, for all uh, sectors essentially. And then the final piece there is around the pricing of some of these courses, um, shifting away from that traditional MOOC approach of free with an upgrade certification at the end, um, and aligned with, with learner needs and learner aspirations, actually, and what learners are used to. Um, lots of the, the courses and, uh, and products offered by these models are on a subscription basis. Um, and that means learners pay a, a fee up front for either a short course, a, a pathway of courses, or indeed, unlimited access to to a uh, a platform's um, portfolio of, of, of offerings. Uh, if I move on to the next slide. Um, the next slide, and again, this is our second key point, is around what we're calling the digitization of education. Um, and as I said, I think Tim's point earlier and, and the stats from, from UCAS uh, play out our, our head, headline point here is that um, we see an increase and in demand for for online and blended, um, but we absolutely don't see that as a replacement of traditional learning methods. And as I say, those UCAS stats today bear, bear out that statement. Um, and, and what we've seen in terms of global trends and Google trends um, over the last year is that th that that increase in in demand for online learning uh, spikes last year. Um, but we are seeing uh, approximately a doubling of the search volume from that pre-pandemic level. So there has been a, a shift uh, in the in the demand from learners for this type of learning. But it's not a it's not a transformation that is going to completely replace campus or, or even campus and some blended learning. Um, for our perspective, um, online learning is there for for particular groups of learners. Um, who are seeking to further educate, to, to further their learning and education through different pathways and different routes. Um, but as I say, this is a, it's an increased demand for that flexibility, but it's it, not a replacement for that traditional learning. Um, what are the factors affecting this digitization? And I think the, 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 the key ones there are um, that job replace, um, displacement. So over the next short period, really up to the five years, uh, a WEF World Economic Forum report approximated 85 million jobs could be displaced um, with that interaction of, of human and machines. Um, but aligned with that, a, a growth of over 100 million new jobs may emerge. Um, the, the the need for learners to um, upskill and change their learning actually as they go through their career path. Um, is, is something we're seeing and we've got some comments on that that, that I'll go through shortly. But um, I think the, the key thing and the, the outline and, and the overall um, take out from this slide is that really we're seeing learners are not going into the industry and in the workplace and expecting a job for life. Um, the, the stat there is that um, 15 year olds will navigate 17 jobs across five careers. Um, as I say, for, for those that are going in, into to the workplace. Um, and yeah, I think the idea is that, that the, the old traditional approach of um, A-levels onto a degree, it, it will be there for certain learners, but it's definitely not all that um, the education sector is going to need to provide. About two minutes left, um, Sean. Two minutes, OK. I'll skip quickly over these ones. So these are um, slides in terms of quotes from, from a few of the uh, colleagues we work with. So. Um, Josie Foster, the uh, VC of the OU, uh, and then Nick from Condé Nast. Um, really, it's, as I said, th that skill set that, that learners are going to need for jobs is very difficult to predict. Um, and the ability to offer learners and courses that, that uh, respond to those needs is going to be crucial for the HE sector. Uh, final slide here, and this is a really in-depth slide, and I'm more than happy to share these and go through um, with anyone after the after the meeting and the call with um, a, a kind of a, a quick follow-up. But essentially, and, and what we're hoping to see and what I think we will see is more partnerships and collaboration. Um, and that's not just with HE, I think, as I said before, that's with industry. And what that hopefully will lead to is an opportunity for more flexible courses. Um, so not just traditional masters and degrees, but 
but the, the unbundling and the kind of um, uh, the, the splitting out of those degrees into micro credentials, which are more uh, accessible for learners. Um, the opportunity there for the HE sector is new revenue streams. So these are not just traditional learners that are coming onto campus. These are learners that can take courses um, um, as and when they wish and, and at different points throughout their, their career path, actually. Um, and that was what the, the, the four um, personas at the top actually shown. Um, what we're looking at here is learners looking for different products, as I say, at different points throughout their career. So um, we could be looking at uh, a particular learner that, that has got an in-depth understanding through professional um, experience that doesn't need a kind of introductory course and can go straight onto a micro credential. But conversely, people that are looking for career changes and career shifts might need that lower level of learning. So the short course uh, on micro credentials as a route into a full degree or a full master's uh, is something that we're looking to develop and produce. Um, but I'll leave uh, and the final statement here is about going back to to um, Louise's point around a learner centred um, approach to this is that learners are different. They've got different motivations, abilities uh, and levels of commitment. So I think what we're hoping to do for future learn is definitely um, respond to that and, as I say, develop pathways of learning for for um, the future. Yeah. I'll leave it there, Phil. Is that OK? Any questions? That, that, no, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we do have, I think we have two questions in the in the chat as well. Um, Richard Yui, um, I've just given you the uh, permission to unmute yourself. Would you would you like to ask Sean your question? It's it's about uh, the um, the micro credentials and have how, how they evolve. Um, so some of that uh, might be um, a higher education doing that with uh, employers, recognition by employers, stacking all this. So how do you see that development? Um, yeah, thanks for the question, Richard. I think it's a really good question. Um, it, it, it's something that's very nascent at the moment, actually. There is a, uh, a micro, a common micro credential framework that the EU are, I think it's in place, but are definitely working on developing. Um, and what we've seen at FutureLearn so far is that the micro credentials we've got uh, on the platform are very much standalone. So they're individual courses um, developed by individual institutions. Um, I think over the, the next five, five to ten years, we will see that framework um, become more established. And I think what that will do will be, and I think it will the enable that that um, stacking that you mentioned uh, of different micro credentials and, di and different um, courses from different institutions. And I think from a learner perspective, that's great because you can pick and hopefully you can pick the best content um, from the best institutions and the institutions that are offering the most innovative um, and distinctive parts of a degree, essentially. Um, again, this is this is future looking. I think five to ten years is, is, is the time frame for this. Um, but as I see, I think going back to that learner centered approach, it's, it's what learners um, I think will be looking for. Uh, and I think there's there's an opportunity there for for for, learn, for, for, for um, institutions across the sector to think about um, where where they sit and where their um, where their specialities lie actually, and, and what learners are going to take from from those areas. Um, and just just as Ken as an example, we've launched two two areas so far. We've looked at politics as a as a start point for for micro credentials uh, and expert tracks, which are a group of short courses on that subscription model. Um, from law and politics as well. Uh, so yeah, I think the, the opportunity to stack courses is very attractive and I think it's something that will increase over the next coming years. Thank you. Um, we do have one other question as well um, from Swati uh, Dabas. Uh, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Um, would you like to unmute yourself and ask Sean your question? Uh, thank you. Um, Sean, um, I'm just... just um, uh, I think you've muted yourself again, Swati. Um, sorry, uh, Sean, uh, just a question around blockchain uh, tech, if you are planning to use that for transferring credits across institutions, um, you know, like universities or um, industry as such, where if at all we get employed later on, uh, the credentials or the credits that we earn uh, through FutureLearn uh, can be um, sort of recognized all over the place. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, no, that's a really, really good point. And, and as I understand at the moment, so obviously that's that's not in the pipeline. But I think, it, again, with the growth of blockchain across different sectors and different industries, I think it's something that that is probably on the horizon. Um, the In terms of the transferring of credits, as I say, that's that's not um, that's not commonplace yet. But I think it's definitely, as I say, um, something to look forward to going forward from a learner perspective. Um, but that will definitely be, need to be aligned with that common micro credential framework to ensure that the quality um, aspects of of a uh, online course and micro credential um, align with standard university regulations for um, postgraduate and and and, and uh, bachelor's level courses. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much.